everybody. Happy Wednesday. It's a good day to praise the Lord. Let's all stand. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. You can feel this God's song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me, when I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing. Your love makes me sing. Your love makes me sing, sing, sing. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Our God can't make us sing. Who can? We are children of God. That is something to sing about. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, God. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in of his love for me. His love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Father's house, there's 
God, we thank you, Lord, that we have been chosen. God, that we've been adopted and grafted in to your family, God, your bloodline. Lord, that you call us child. You are our Father. You are our Lord. And God, we thank you for the love that you have shown us, God, in doing that for us. We thank you for the great sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we stand secure in him. We love you, God. Nail pierced hands, wounded side. This is love. This is love, the holy heart was sacrificed. This is love, this is love. Here. 
pierced hands. Nail pierced hands, a wounded side. This is love. This is love. The holy heart will sacrifice. This is love. This is love I bow down to the Holy One I bow down to the Lamb I bow down to the Worthy One
lion and the lamb Lion and the lamb How great is our God Stay with me How great is our God And all will see how great How great awesome God we thank you for your amazing mighty power we thank you so much Lord God that you have um, you've revealed yourself to us God and you've sent us the comforter you've sent us the Holy Spirit to to lead us and guide us in all truth Lord that we can discern your will for our lives father we pray that God as we sit under your word tonight that we would receive that word God with a a willing heart a heart that is willing um, to be instructed and Lord that you would show us tonight God what you would have for us and the way you would have us to walk that we would be obedient God to your voice we thank you that you are a good shepherd and we thank you Lord that we can hear your voice. Lord, we are so thankful. We love you. We thank you for your love. And we praise you, God. And we pray that you would be magnified in this place tonight, God. We pray that you'd be with Pastor Sean. God, anoint him, Lord. And God, may we just receive your word with joy. Thank you for your life that you breathe into us through your word. We love you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How great is our God. Good evening, guys. How are you doing tonight? Are you good? You're here tonight, so you're, God is good, right? We're all doing good if we're here. <laughs> um, I know, it's me again. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, no, I'm thankful for this. For this, uh, we'll be in First John chapter three tonight, verses one through three. I know I don't get very far um, when I teach, but we'll be First John chapter three, verses one through three tonight. Um, God, we'll hear about God's love tonight. I'm excited about it. 
Um, before we do, though, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Heavenly and gracious Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for tonight. We want to thank you for being able to gather here. Lord, to hear your word, to sit at your feet again. Uh, Father, I just ask that tonight uh, that you would just bring your word alive, that you would, uh, something that we might have heard over and over in our lives and that we know very well, that you would make it new for us tonight and fresh and it would uh, just just land on soft hearts, Lord, and on open minds, that we would receive it, and Lord, that we would be changed by your word tonight, and the love that you showed us, that we would, we would show love to you in return, Lord, and that we would walk out our lives the way you would have us, that we would bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, we love you, and we thank you again for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so 1 John chapter 3. Um, before I begin, I, I, when I was doing research and just reading, I uh, came across a story I would like to, to share with you that I think paints a, a, a picture of God's love. Um, it's, a, it's a true story. It was actually in, in National Geographic several years ago. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a penetrating picture of God's love. Um, a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park Forest rangers began their trek up a mountain to assess the damage. One ranger found a bird literally, literally petrified in ashes, perched on the ground at the base of a tree. Somewhat sickened by the eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. When he struck it, three tiny chicks scurried from under their dead mother's wings. The loving mother, keenly aware of impending disaster, had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings. See, she could have flown away to safety, but she had refused to abandon her babies. When the blaze arrived and the heat scorched her small body, the mother had remained steadfast because she had been willing to die that those under the cover of her wings would live. It just paints a picture there of God's love, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. See, God sent His Son Jesus, and Jesus could have left he, could, he knew what he had to do. He could have left at any time. He could have left us to exactly what we deserved and what we were owed. He could have left and gone back to heaven. But he didn't because he loves us and he loves his children. And so he stayed and he put us under his wing and he paid that price for us. And I just tell you guys, I, I had another sermon. I was preparing and I was almost done with it. And I just came to a halt. I just came to a stop. And I just wasn't hearing anything anymore. And I said, Lord, what's going on? What, what do I need to do? And I, and I was hoping he would say, Sean, just do this and, and do that. And then, then finish up with this and you'll be good. And, and, I, and I would have been great. But he took me in a different direction <laughs> completely. And he said, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm, if you tell me to do away with this, I'll do away with it. And he said, Sean, I want you to tell them that I love them. Just tell them that I love them. And I kind of laughed. I said, Lord, <laughs> I hate to break this to you, but um, the people I'm going to talk to tonight, they know that, that you love them, Lord. They know this. Many of them heard it their whole lives. It's not going to be, you know, yeah, we, we, we say Jesus loves you, God loves you. All the time we hear it, and it becomes... We say it so much, I think even Christians, it, it starts to become cliche. It's, it, we start to be numb by it. It doesn't mean anything to us when we hear that. And we should. When someone said, Jesus loves you, God loves you, it should stir you inside. It should do something in your spirit. You should feel it when they say that. So we have to be careful with that. And, and I said, Lord, they know that you love them. What? And, and then he just said, remind them. Remind them, Sean. Yes, they know, but remind them. And so I started thinking about that. What does it mean? What would it mean to remind them of your love? Lord, where do I even begin? Genesis through Revelation, it speaks of your love. It tells us of your love. Where do I even begin? And then I just, he brought to mind. He said, remind, remember. And, and then it brought to mind communion. We take communion. When we take communion, we remember as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, right? As often as you, as you take this, this bread, which is my body, and drink this cup, which is my blood that I spilled for you, do it in remembrance of me. Remember me when you do this and what I did for you. 
And, you know, I, I would say we need to have communion with the Lord every single day. We need to remember that every single day. It should be right here, written on our hearts, what he did for us, his body that was broken, the blood that was shed. And he, he brought me to 1 John 3. And before we get in, I just I kind of want to paint another picture for you. And, and it's, you know, we remember the body. We remember his blood. And a lot of people think about the cross. When we think about what Jesus did for us, we think about the cross, the crucifixion. People have the tattoos of the cross. People wear the cross necklace. There's, you know, we think about the cross. But we need to remember what he went through before he went to the cross, which was horrific which was, was really that people should not even be able to watch. It was so horrific what they did, what the Romans did. The Romans, he was scourged. Pilate sent him to be scourged. Pilate was like, I'm going to send him to be scourged. I'm done with him. I'm going to let him go. Because after someone was scourged, they, were barely, they barely had life in them. And the Jewish people, it was, it was given that you could give 40 lashes when you scourge someone, but they would hold, they would only give 39 because usually the 40th lash would prove to be fatal. No man could live through that. See, Jesus wasn't under the Jewish, he wasn't being tried by by the Jewish people, he was under the Roman. So who knows how many? He could have had more than 40, more than a, a man could even, should be able to bear. And he took that on for us. So scourging, just to, to paint a little picture for you real quick. When you were scourged, first off, you were taken out and you were stripped completely naked. In front of everyone watching, you were stripped. You bore our shame. That's shameful. That's embarrassing. In front of everyone. So that his whole flesh was open. That, you could, that it was open to the scourging that was about to take place. And then there was usually a, a two-foot stone base pillar that they, they laid him over and they bound him to this pillar. And he couldn't move. He couldn't move. And they would stretch your hands out, either over your head or in front of you. And they, all this would be stretched. You couldn't, you couldn't do this and take the blow. It was all stretched out. And you were fixed. So he had to take every blow. He couldn't move. He couldn't escape it. He had to take that. And these... The scourging stick, or also known as a cat of nine tails, it, it, it had pieces of metal and bone and glass, wire, whatever could cause mutilation to flesh was on the end of this rod. You, we watch movies all the time, and we see Jesus has these little bitty stripes on him, a little bit of blood, a little bit of blood running down here. It, he didn't get whipped with a horse whip. He got... His body was mutilated. He gave himself completely, all of his flesh. It was torn and ripped from his body. And he couldn't move. He was fixed. He could have gone away, but he stayed. He endured. He was steadfast in his love. Some some ancient documentation says that being being scourged, would, the back would be so mutilated that the spine would be visible. It would rip the muscle right off of you. It would, they would, you would have a centurion standing on either side and they would whip across you and pull your flesh, and just rip it open. It's, it's a sight when we, we think of our Savior doing that for us. It's horrific. Other parts would be exposed. Some of the inner bowels and organs would be hanging out of a person because he was so because it was so shredded and ripped. So he went through that, and then he had to pick up his cross and bear it on on this back that was laid open. These shoulders that were probably nothing but bone and tore tendons, and he had to walk up that hill. And we all know crucifixion was one of the most painful, slow deaths that you could, that you could lift or, or experience. It was, it was a horrible way to die. They nailed him to that cross. Just to fight for your breath, you would, you would suffocate. Everything inside of you would be in pain, extreme pain. And for him to get a breath, and he's hanging on these nails, they're through his feet and they're through his hands, he would have to try to lift himself up just to get a breath. 
it's excruciating. It's the love he showed us. He didn't back out. He knew what he came for. Christmas is around the corner. We celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus coming into the world. And it's a joyous time. But that baby, he knew what he came for. And he finished the work that was set before him. He did not run away. He didn't go back to heaven. He could have. But he did that for us. I just think it's, it's important to, to have that picture in our minds before we get into 1 John 3 here so that we can just maybe just get a small taste of the love that God has for us. Because I was studying this, and I'm telling you guys, I still don't completely understand. I don't think we ever will completely understand this love that God has given to us. It's beyond anything. So, John, he wrote the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and he wrote Revelation. John is known as the apostle of love, or the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we see John at the foot of the cross with the three Marys. We see John there. What does that tell me? He was the disciple of love. It told me, it shows me that John understood this love that Jesus had for him. When we understand the love that Jesus has for us, we want to be close to him. The other disciples, they, they didn't quite get it. Some of them ran off. They were afraid for their lives. They were hiding. Some had watched from a safe distance. He was right there. How do we know? Because Jesus told him, Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Like I said, he wouldn't have heard that from far away because Jesus could barely breathe. He had to lift himself up to even speak. So he was there. This, gospel, this disciple whom Jesus loved. We know that's John because in the Gospel of John, this phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is used six times. It's not used in any of the other Gospels. It's kind of funny because John wrote the Gospel of John, so he's referring to himself when he speaks of the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> it's funny, but at the same time, it kind of showed me that, hey, John was proud of this love. John wasn't saying, I'm the only disciple that Jesus really loves, or he loves me more than these guys. He was saying, no, he understood the love that Jesus had for him. He was close to Jesus, and he was proud of it. Jesus loves me. What if we all walked around every day, we're proud as John about Jesus loving us. Jesus loves me. You're crazy. I know. It's fine. Jesus loves me. He loves me when I'm crazy. He, he loves me. He knew that. That's why I love John. He's, he's cool. I like him. <laughs> so we'll open up in 1 John chapter 3. We'll read the first three verses and we'll go back and kind of look at some things here. Um, but basically tonight, again, the Lord said remind them. So he wants to remind us of his great love and what he did for us. And we're going to see who we are in Jesus and in God, who we are. And we'll see what we're going to be. And then we'll see what we should be to finish up. So ch chapter 3, verse 1 here says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God! Exclamation mark. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So we look at the first the first verse here, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Let's look at that first word there, behold. This word means to see or observe, to gaze upon, to look at intently, to meditate. To meditate on this. Behold this love that God has given us. Stop what you're doing. Stop with the busyness of life. Stop with your worries, your concerns, whatever's going on. Stop. Take a minute. 
Look at this love. We should look at it intently. Meditate on it. You see, I think it's funny that John uses, he he says this right here, behold, because you think John was one of the twelve. John was one that walked with Jesus, right? He was was considered to be in the inner circle. Imagine what he beheld. Imagine what he saw with Jesus. He saw the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead rise. Think about the things he saw. It's crazy. It would blow our minds. Behold. If I saw some of that stuff, it's my behold face. I'm like, behold. Did that just happen? What's going on? So he says, behold. And see, this is the same John that wrote Revelation. The same John that ascended into heaven and saw the glory of heaven that saw all this great stuff. He not only saw the miracles and things, but he saw the heavens. He could have said, behold, look at the glory of the heavens. No. What does he say? He says, behold, what manner of love. It's all about the love of God. He chose his words very wisely. Because this love makes everything else seem so small. Everything. Nothing compares with his love. So take a minute. Let's behold that. Let's look at that. This manner of love. And in 1 Peter, it, it, it talks about the prophets of old. The prophets, they, the ones who spoke of this, of this plan of salvation, this Messiah that was to come, these things that were to happen. It said they inquired about these things. This, what was going to take place. They inquired of it. And then Peter said, which now we preach to you, this gospel, this good news of His grace, of His love, and His mercy. We preach it now to you. We testified to it. We saw it with our own eyes. We walked with Him. We talked with Him. And then, and then towards the end of that, that verse, I don't have the exact verse, I'm sorry, but, and then it says the angels desired to look into these things. These heavenly beings, great and mighty angels, they desire to look in to, to what? To this manner of love. That he's bestowed on us. It's, it's a love, again, that we, that we can't comprehend with our minds. It doesn't make sense to us. I love my children more than anything. I would do anything for my children. God has taught me so much about love and sacrifice and selflessness since I had my kids. I love them to death. I would do anything for them unless it involved harming them in some way. I know the love I feel, but it fails in comparison to this love that he's talking about, that God showed us. Gave his body completely. Gave his life. It was ours. We should have been tied to that post. So look at this love that he's given you know, to be a child of God, just thinking about this, it just made me think that, it, and I'm sure you guys can relate, but God can make you feel like the only child, right? He can make you feel like the only child. Like, like you're the only one in the room. Like you're the only one He cares about. I love that. But there's millions of believers. There's millions of children He has. But He can make you... You can have that intimate relationship with Him and you can feel like the only one and you just... He pours Himself into you. Gives you all of His attention. We don't understand that because we can only give our attention to one person at a time. I think women can maybe uh, give two because they use both, but men struggle with one sometimes. Um, But He gives you all of His attention. He pours into you. We get to be in His family. We get to be children of God. But I want to point out something real quick, though. That everyone, you know, we're all children of God. It's not biblical. We're not all children of God. Not everyone is a child of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall have everlasting life. Not perish, but have everlasting life. The world, they all know that verse. Even... People who are not Christians, they everyone knows that verse, and they take it. 
And they, they kind of shuffle themselves into God's family on their own. We're not all children of God. It's not biblical. I'll just point out a few verses here to show you. Ephesians 2, 3, it tells us, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So we see this phrase here, children of wrath. This doesn't mean that there's children out causing wrath and wreaking havoc in the streets. This means right here, it means the children who are storing up wrath for themselves, storing up God's wrath for themselves because they conducted themselves in the lust of, uh, lust of their flesh. Living in that flesh, you're storing up wrath for yourself, God's wrath. That's not a good place to be. I don't want to be one of those children. No, sir. Keep that. Romans 9, 8. We see again, it says, That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So we see here, children of the flesh. It says, these are not children of God. If you're a child of the flesh, if you're looking every day to, to satisfy your flesh, to feed your flesh, there's a good chance that you might think you're a child of God, but you're a child of the flesh. And it says here, you are not a child of God. John eight forty four. We see again here. It says, You are the father, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So Jesus, talking to the Pharisees here, he says, you are of your father the devil. If he calls your father the devil, that means that, once again, you're not a child of God. You're, your father is the devil. You want to do, you seek the desires of, of your father. This world, he's the prince of this world. We, we, we seek after those things. We want the appreciation of the world. We want, we want to, you know, a lot of young people, I've got to sow my wild oats while I'm young. No, you don't. Don't do that. You're, you're, you're chasing after the devil. Don't sow any wild oats. I've sowed some. I'm going to tell you, it don't, it don't reap a good, <laughs> you don't get a good harvest with that. Well, I'm going to miss out. You will miss out. You miss out on a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, a lot of heartache, a lot of depression, loneliness. Everything the Father doesn't want you to. Don't seek those things. Do what your Father wants you to do. Your Father in heaven. Seek to please Him. So how do we know if we are a child of God? Oh, well, here's another verse. I'm giving them a ton of verses. I'm sorry, but <laughs> I'll do another one. So John 1, 12 through 13 tells us, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Who's a child of God? Those who receive him. Those who were born of God, not of the flesh, not of the will of man. Those who were born of God. 1 John chapter 2, finishing up the chapter 2, he speaks of being born of God. You can go back and read it on your own time. Um, but we're born of God. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. What must I do? You must be born again, Nicodemus. What are you talking about? How can I enter my mother's womb for a second time? No, 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 no. Not born of the flesh a second time. Born of the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit because we receive Him and then He gives us His Spirit. And we're transformed. We're a new creation. 
Old things are gone. New things are here. We become a child. We become adopted into his family because it's him living in us. It's no longer us. And so Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, I love this verse. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He chose us for the foundation of the world. He chose us. I want you. I want you. I want you to be my child. And we're adopted when we accept him, when we ask him, and when we make him Lord over our life. Because we can ask Jesus to come into our hearts. We can say a prayer. We can ask Him to come into our hearts. But until we make Him Lord over our life, it means nothing. I'm sorry to say that. Sorry, not sorry. But it means nothing. We said a prayer. We, We have emotion and we feel something. We make Him Lord of our life. That's when we give Him full reign. Give him the keys to the car and let him drive. So we're adopted. And in John 14, 18, he tells us again, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He's not going to leave us. I'm going to leave us orphans. He didn't leave us here on earth. He came. He could have came, gave up his body, died, and left and said, all right, I did my job. I gave my body. I'm going back to be with the Father. Sayonara. Good luck. He didn't leave. He never, he's never left us. Because even when he went back to heaven, he gave us his spirit freely. He said, no, we don't leave us orphans. We're not lost in this world. We're not alone either. Never alone. He's always with us. So, we'll go down. I'm, I'm done with that. There. We'll go down. To, sorry. <laughs> so, long-winded. Um, but no, it, so we'll look at, at, at the second part of that verse there. We're called children of God, and it says, Therefore the world does not know us because, what? It did not know Him. So we're children of God if God is living through us then guess what? The world's not going to know us. Neither should the, world, should, the, should the world know us. They shouldn't know us. And we shouldn't desire to be known by the world. If the world is going this way, and everyone in the world is going this way, I tell people all the time, you turn around and you go that way. Don't get mixed up in the world. The world is a crazy place now. Y'all can see that as, as much as I can. It's crazy. Nothing but lies and deception and just debauchery, evilness. It, the guy's got to be, Jesus got to be coming back soon, guys. <laughs> it's crazy. Don't, don't be involved in the world. The world didn't know him. Don't expect the world to know you. It shouldn't. If the world knows you and the world accepts you and the world welcomes you and the world will try to welcome you in, but if, you're, if you don't look any different in the world, Something's wrong. You can say you're a Christian all day long. You can say, I'm a child of God. But if, you, if no one can tell you any different from the rest of the world, you're a child of the flesh. That's exactly what you are. You're a child of the world. You're a child of wrath. You're storing up wrath for yourself. The world doesn't, the world doesn't know us. God... Jesus came here, and in John 1.10 it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. He was here. Everything was made through Him, and for Him, and by Him. Standing face to face, but they didn't know who He was. Why? Because they were living in sin. They were living in darkness. They loved the darkness. People love the darkness, don't they? But we're children of light. We speak the truth. What happens when we do that? People don't like us. They hate us. Why? Because... We just exposed your sin. You were comfortable over there in the dark. 
in the corner by yourself, doing your sin, living in your sin. Then this Christian came along and spoke some truth to you. It convicted. It convicts him. I didn't know him. In John 15, 18 through 19. Sorry, I know i got a lot of verses tonight. But it says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's going to hate you. People at work, they're going to hate you. People at the grocery store are going to hate you. People are going to hate you. I don't care how loving you are. It blows my mind. I can be the nicest, most loving person to someone, and they will just spew hate. It's, but I know what it is. We know what it is. But they, 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 they hated him. Is, is a servant greater than his master? No. If they hated him, it's going to hate us. Get used to it. And it's not that we go around pointing our finger at people. Well, you're wrong. Well, you're, you're, you're doing this. You're wrong. You're wrong. No. We just speak the truth, right? We speak the language of our Father because we're His children. We speak His language. And when we do that, they're convicted. And we just let the Holy Spirit deal with that. We take it on the chin. Let the Holy Spirit deal with that. Because He's working something much greater than we could ever do. Anything we could ever say. Nothing I could say to save anybody. He does all the work. And then it says, in verse 2 here, moving right along, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So now we are children of God. Right now, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to have some... Children of God's ceremony, like we are children of God now. Once we accept Him, we're adopted into His family like that. We're His children. And we can know that. We can walk around smiling every day with our heads held high because we are children of God. Right now. We get the kingdom. We get to experience His kingdom right now. Not not when we... Not just when we get to heaven. And it says, it says, it hasn't been revealed, yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So, we don't know. We have no clue what we're going to look like, what we're going to be like. I don't know about you. It doesn't bother me. I know it's going to be much better than what i got right now. What we're living in right now, right? We don't know. No, we're going to have new bodies. The one thing I do know for sure, I'm going to have an eternal six-pack. It's, it's, never, it's never going to fade. It's never going to go away. It will be there like chiseled stone forever. <laughs> we don't know, but we know we will have glorified bodies. They'll be perfected. They'll be good. My wife probably just said amen to that, but... It's, it's all good. I know. But we're going to have glorified bodies. We don't, I don't need to know. But it says when, when we see Him, when He is revealed, whether that means whether we die here on this earth and we're, we're in, front of the, in front of the Lord or whether He calls us up, which I feel like is going to happen pretty soon myself. Um, so I'm looking... I'm, in the like the rapture position, I'm ready to like go. Sometimes I'll just walk out the store and do that. No, not yet. All right, not yet. I'm good. Just, just getting ready. But either way, when we see him, then what does it say? Then we sh- we 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 will see. It's been revealed, but we will know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like him. You know, and he's not saying right here that, you know, we get to heaven, we're all going to look like Jesus. But much of people, that would be weird, right? We're not going to look like that. It's not going to be a physical appearance he's talking about here. God made us all unique and special. Why would he, he he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? 
He's going to make us all unique and special in heaven. We're all going to have new bodies, new names. We don't know what that's going to be like, but it says we're going to be like him. We're going to, to be, in other words, we're going to be the reflection of God when we see him. God is, is glorious. He's going to be greater. He's, he's great. He's great. I don't, there's no words to explain him. But we're going to be that reflection. We're going to be like him. We're going to be perfect the way he originally created us. We're not going to have sin. We're not going to have sinful bodies that decay. We're not going to have sinful minds. We'll be like him. We'll be that reflection of God. What he made us to be from the beginning. We'll be made perfect. We'll be as he is. We'll see him as he is. That's going to be awesome. See him as he is. I'm excited about that. And we see all these pictures of Jesus, and ain't none of them Jesus. Y'all know that. He had this perfect beard and the, and the brown hair, and you know, and we see the, the movies and Jesus everywhere he walks. Ah. Mm. You just, you always, uh, Jesus got the blue eyes and the perfect beard and the, and the blown out hair. He looks perfect. You wouldn't have been able to pick him out of a crowd when he was here on earth. He's just another man. But we see all these pictures of, of God and Jesus and, it, you know, we don't know what he's going to look like. There's a, there is a, a small picture that in, in Daniel and Revelation gives us a little glimpse of what Jesus looked like. Daniel 10.6 says his body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. That don't paint a picture for you. Go home and draw that out and see what that looks like. Pretty awesome, right? See him coming down the street at you. That would terrify me. But it would be awesome. I mean, it would be awesome. But he's so glorious. We can't, right now, we're not able to even put our eyes on him. We we couldn't even look at him right now. In the state that we're in, couldn't even look at him. In Exodus, Exodus 33, 20. Tells Moses, but he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. No man can see him and live. He's too glorious. He's too great. But we we will see him. We'll be face to face with him one day. And we'll be able to look upon him because we will be like him in his image. That's exciting. We're his children. We get to go home, be with our dad, and we, we don't have any of this junk anymore no more sin will be perfect I hate sin I hate it with passion I'm so ready to be done with sin even if it's just losing my temper on the highway or something I've got to catch myself I'm tired of it I'm tired of living that way I'm, t- I'm tired of those things we'll be, we'll be like him we'll, we'll see him as he is and be in glory with Him. I'm excited about that. And then it says, to finish up here in verse 3, it says, And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. We purify ourselves. We have this hope. We have this hope that we are, that, that Jesus, that God loves us, and this great love that He gave us, and that we get to be called His children right now, here on earth, and that one day we get to be in glory with Him, and we get to be heirs of everything. He, just think about that. He came and He died a gruesome death so that He could share everything in glory with us. I don't get that. So we have that hope of what's to come. We have that hope right now of who we are of knowing that He loves us and who we are right now and what we're going to be one day. We have that hope. And it says what? That we, we purify ourselves just as He is pure. 
How do we purify ourselves? Again, I always say this, but we read the Word. By the washing of the water of the Word, we purify ourselves. Because if we're pouring this in, if we're pouring this truth in, and His Word, all those impurities are getting worked out. It's like my old truck I used to have. That thing would sputter down the road, and I'd go put some additive in it. It's whatever I could find. And it would run a little get those impurities out, and that thing would take off for about a few hours, then it would start sputtering again. But it gets, cleans that stuff out. So we're cleaning ourselves every day with this Word, washing ourselves with it, pouring it in, because all that stuff, it's not the outward stuff. We can walk around all day, outward appearance. Man, look at that guy. He's a, he's a good Christian. Look at that man. He just looks like a good Christian. On the inside is where all the impurities are, right? So if we're not ingesting this, if we're not taking this in, it just starts corroding even more. And no one can see that. Only God can see man's heart. So we have to purify ourselves in that way. We also purify ourselves by, by choosing and walking with God, walking in His commandments, walking in His will. We purify ourselves by the choices that we make, choosing to be pure. So we know, we know the love of our Father. We know, again, our Father sees all and knows all. We ain't fooling nobody. We live. We make those decisions. If we, if we, we want to purify ourselves because we know He's coming soon, we know that He loves us, and we should want to be pleasing to Him we shouldn't be looking at pornography. We shouldn't be getting drunk. We shouldn't be doing drugs. We shouldn't be lying to people. We shouldn't be stealing from people. That's not being pure. That's having impurities. We've got to purify ourselves just as He is pure because we're all a work in progress, right? We're all under construction. And we're not going to be, the day we stand face to face with Jesus, that's when His work will be complete in us. We're working towards that right now. He shouldn't have much work left to do on us by the time we see Him. <laughs> you know? Like, oh, wait, this is going to take a little bit longer than I thought. No, we're working towards that. We're being purified so that we can be like Him when we see Him, be as He is with that Spirit. And again, how do we purify ourselves? Just kind of goes along with reading the Word here, but most of us know this. Romans 12, 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed. Renewing of your mind. The mind is a powerful thing, right? Sometimes we can't control what goes in that mind, right? But we can control what we do with it once it goes in there. It's not a sin for something to go in there, but it's a sin when we take it and we do something with it. So we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's a constant thing. We don't, we don't just go and read a devotional, my mind is renewed, I'm ready to take on the day. Nope. Five minutes later, you, something's going to come along. Start knocking at your door. Renew that mind continuously. So we purify ourselves to what? To be pleasing to Him. Everything He's done, the beating He endured, the, the cross that He endured, taking our place, laying His life down so that He could share His kingdom with us because we did what? Because we did nothing whatsoever. We did nothing. We deserve nothing. Why do we want to be pleasing? Because of what He's done. Because of His love. We should love Him in return. I just want to share a story that I heard, heard a, a while back that kind of stuck with me. Just in closing here. 
And there was a group of teenagers driving down the road one day. And they started talking. And they were like, hey, hey, let's go get some alcohol. Let's go, let's go to my house. Let's go party. Let's get drunk. Be fun. And one of the girls in the vehicle, she spoke up and she said, no, I don't want to do that. If you can, just take me home. And everyone in the car started to tease her and mock her. What's wrong? You scared? Were you scared your daddy's going to find out and he's going to hurt you? And the girl said, no, I'm afraid my daddy's going to find out and I'm going to hurt him. Do we think that way? Before we make our decisions, do we remember, remind them of my love? Do we remember this love that he gave us? Do we choose to go to that house with those people and do that? Or do we say, no, I don't want my father to find out. I don't want, because it'll hurt him. We should think that way every day, every choice that we make. Be pleasing to our Father because of the goodness and the love that He bestowed on us. That we are His children. It's amazing. We can't understand this love. But John tells us to behold, to stop, to look at it, to admire it, to gaze upon it, meditate on it. We've heard it so many times, but it's so true. It never gets old. Father, I just want to thank you with all of my heart for your great love, for counting me as one of your children, for counting us as your children, as heirs in your kingdom because of nothing that we've done, but because of everything that you gave. I want to thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your word tonight. It's so simple, but we miss it. As Christians, we miss it all the time, and it slips right past us. Lord, write, write this love on our hearts. That this, this day forward, from tonight, that love would be imprinted on our lives and every decision that we make every choice that comes along that we would choose because you chose us that we would choose you above all that we would be pleasing in your sight that we would glorify you Lord in everything that we say and that we do and that we walk through this world and allow you to live through us and to know that this world has nothing for us and this world is going to shun us and hate us. But you, Lord, give us strength through your word. And Lord, just by your love, we're so, so grateful. And we give you a small token, Lord, of what you've given us that's so incredible. Thank you again, Father, for your word. Bless your people. Be with everyone here this week. Give them strength. Give them courage. Give them boldness. Father, may no one be discouraged or depressed that they would lean on this love that you've given us and be refreshed. We ask this in your mighty and precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand. sweet sound in your